women have this idea that in order to be feminine, they have to wear flowy dresses and look a certain way and dance sexy on Instagram and like do all the thing that the feminine embodiment teachers are doing. That. And you know, in Muse, my program, we talk about your muse is yours. What does she look like? Mm. What is what does that part of your essence identify as? And how does she want to express herself? And that for me is, I think some of the greatest work we can do is to dismantle our um, hooks on what we think we should be or what we think masculine should look like or feminine should look like or how it should talk and how it should move in the world and go, what's my truth here? Because all of us have an individualized truth. And mm. if we keep collapsing on our own truth and dropping our own truth, that's that's the problem. That is the inherent problem. Not that you don't wear flowy dresses and look a certain way and talk a certain way. It's that you have collapsed and dropped yourself. What's up, everybody? I'm Alexi Panos. I'm Preston Smiles. And we are the co-founders of Sanctuary, a community where life coaching and spirituality come together for some amazing, mind-blowing conversations, learnings, distinction, and of course, community. Today, we are going into the dark, deep truth of the world of masculine and feminine polarity. Oh, this is such a hot topic. It always has been, right? It always has been. Yes. I think actually, fun fact, uh, and I still believe this, for a while I was like, screw masculine and feminine dynamics. Like this shit is bullshit. People use it to punish themselves and punish each other. And I do believe that. Like people are like, you're not in your feminine enough or you're too masculine or you're too this. And while that may be true in some ways, it's just like personal development. You don't want to weaponize any of this information against yourself, which so many women do, uh, or somebody else. So Absolutely. that's that's my little public service announcement. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I said the deep, dark truth. Mm. Um, and, and I won't say the truth, I'll say a truth, right? Because we're all interpreting all of this stuff. Um, I do think there there is something to leaning in to the different aspects of ourselves. That, yes, and yes. Humans are meaning-making machines. And the moment we have linguistics and we can bring meaning to something, then we can uh, usually step into it and, and work with it. And so why I like terms like masculinity and femininity is because it gives us at some level, a scope or a gauge from which to compare or uh, our way of being. Yeah. Now, where it gets tricky is when it could be considered toxic masculinity or the idea of toxic masculinity, which we've been sold through, you know, all of the Hulk Hogan's and Clint Eastwood's and these great white heroes that always had the right answer and were stoic and never cried and never felt and would shoot up the dark Indians and all of that stuff, right? There's this, this hyper-masculine idea that all of us have been fed and I do believe it's still super pervasive. It's a part of rape culture. For it's sure. a part of sex trafficking. Yeah. It's a part of the overuse of pornography. And I think that it's also something that is a gift hidden in really dirty, ugly wrapping paper. Mm, okay, so speak about that gift. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so... You know, this one may hurt uh, moms, um, but oftentimes uh, when men are speaking, and I'll just speak for myself, uh, there's a conversation that a lot of men, and this is my opinion, it doesn't have to be right or true, but a lot of men are the products of well-meaning mothers mm -hmm. who did their best to beat out that wild man inside of their little boys. And so these well-meaning mothers who spent more time with their sons based on, you know, society back then in the 80s and 90s and 70s and 60s, these well-meaning mothers tried to make sure that their little boy wasn't like their dad or the guy that raped or abused her or whatever the case may be. And in doing so, she just created a really good liar. 
Mm. She created unconsciously a little boy that did not feel safe to be with his masculine thump and his masculine energy in such a way that he hid it and compartmentalized it and let it come out in these unhealthy ways, which then fast forward to adulthood, prostitution, sex trafficking, and all these things are, in my opinion, a byproduct of this well-meaning mother who didn't have a blueprint on how to raise a little boy. So interesting. Two things that come alive for me when you say this. Number one, as a woman, and I think speaking for a lot of the women I work with, we feel this. We can feel the liars. We can feel the lack of a backbone. We can feel the lack of masculine presence that I think is a byproduct of decades of kids being raised without fathers, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And those who have been raised with fathers, those fathers not showing the way of the initiatory path of saying, here, let's initiate you from uh, adolescence into adulthood. So we have a bunch of, you know, little boys running around in men's clothing um, in adult bodies. And we women can feel that. So that's number one. Number two, as you said that, what's really interesting, I was like, oh, man, women have had that since almost the beginning of time. Like we have had the wild societally programmed out of us Mm -hmm. since the beginning of time. A woman's wild has been considered one of the most dangerous things going back to the Bible. And even hearing that, I'm like, man, like we've never had a chance. We've never had permission. We've never had an example of a woman's wild being okay. And I think Mm -hmm. we're in this amazing phase of reclamation of our wild and what that looks like. But just in hearing that, I'm like, I don't think it was ever okay. Like there was a time that we hear about where the goddess was worshipped and the goddess, Mm -hmm. you know, there's devotion to that and the woman's wild was welcome, but then organized religion came in and X, Y, and Z. But it's just so interesting. I never considered that. So that, right? So now we're talking about two, uh, you know, the the women and men both being uh, neutered in some form or fashion. Domesticated. And domesticated into this sort of way of being and then raising more people, right? (laughs) In the same way that they were sort of socially and historically programmed. Yeah. And, and, And you're correct. I think there is a reclaiming that has uh, been being brought forth by those who call themselves conscious and those who just are deciding that they're no longer willing to play these roles. And here's what's interesting, right? I know there's a lot of people, and even in here in Austin, I was at a dinner the other day and this guy was cracking a joke and he was like, yeah, um, something, something non-binary and the Democrats and I just, you know, sort of took it in and just noticed that there's this anger towards change that's yeah. happening. Yes. There's yes. this like, <laughs> yes. like, like, no, I won't call you by your pronouns and I won't deal with this me too stuff, right? I was just looking at her boobs. It's not a big deal or whatever the case may be. And mm-hmm. I get the pushback. I get the part of, you know, some people and self-included that doesn't want to have to call a person, they, um, and if that's what that person wants to be called, then, you know, we we can be dinosaurs, we can be Blockbuster, or we can be Netflix. And I think that change is here, and it's here now, and there is a a huge, right, the, the pendulum has swung so far over here, because people are so sick and tired of this patriarchal sort of white man's world that we've been all raised in, yeah. that 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 now it's swung all the way over here. And I think the beautiful thing about the masculine and feminine polarity work is there's the micro of it and there's the macro of it. Yeah. And I think we're in the macro, right? It's yeah. swung over here to this sort of like wild, unkept, feminine, where it's like everything's up for change, right? <laughs> yeah. Screw yeah. this, yeah. right? boys can be girls, girls can be boys, let's change our genders at four years old and like all the kind of stuff that comes up. And I think that we're swinging back to somewhere that feels um, juicy and good for for everybody involved. Well, and I think uh, you're speaking to the macro and the micro. I think we are on this macro level of uh, massive transformation. Things are changing in a way where they will never be the same again. And Mm -hmm. that's what transformation really means. But what that's doing, it's inspiring a micro change. It's, it's, it's inspiring the transformation internally where it's like, oh, now that the 
patriarchal system is starting to collapse and the shadow masculine of control is really starting to be examined, now we're starting to look at how has that control set up a way of being in myself mm. that is not true? And that's where the inner polarity of masculine and feminine, no matter how you identify, we mm -hmm. all have those inner polarities. How, how am I in relation to that? Yes. Right? Is my own inner masculine of having my own back knowing my own sense of rightness and worthiness and deservedness to be here. Um, really being able to stand and be the container of I have me so that my inner feminine can radiate and welcome in and invite and inspire. Do I have access to that? Mm -hmm. Or have I been in this dance and puppeteering of myself that. in order to fit into a system that never accepted me in the first place? That, well, here's what's tricky about it is, in order to even reconfigure the furniture in this room, I'd have to have a vision or a picture of it. 100%. And if the media and social media is giving me pictures that don't represent what you just said, then I'm going to repeat what I see in the media and in social media and not uh, an example of someone who may be, you know, deeply in their feminine essence and power without... Um, it leaking or bleeding into this other thing. Yeah. And I, I think there's a huge importance in demonstrations and examples. And where that gets slippery and trickery, tricky is when we try to encapsulate someone as the one example, Yeah. right? So, so when you say that, what do you think of as you say that? Jesus. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I like this is the way you yes. have to be. Or, um, you know, I think of Trump. Yeah. I think of um, Grant Cardone. I think of, you know, there's, there's and, these. And I want to play the conscious who we think of. We yeah. think of the David Data. So we think of yes. Mama Gina. We think yes. of, like, we have these ideas yes. of like, well, here's who I have to be or should be. That. And some are conscious, some are unconscious. It all depends who's looking, right? Yes. Who's judging. Yes. But it's interesting because. In feminine embodiment work, this is one of the biggest things that I come up against is women have this idea that in order to be feminine, they have to wear flowy dresses and look a certain way and dance sexy on Instagram and like do all the thing that the feminine embodiment teachers are doing. That. And, you know, in Muse, my program, we talk about your muse is yours. What does she look like? Mm. What is what does that part of your essence identify as? And how does she want to express herself? And that for me is, I think some of the greatest work we can do is to dismantle our um, hooks on what we think we should be or what we think masculine should look like or feminine should look like or how it should talk and how it should move in the world and go, what's my truth here? Because all of us have an individualized truth. And mm. if we keep collapsing on our own truth and dropping our own truth, that's that's the problem. That is the inherent problem. Not that you don't wear flowy dresses and look a certain way and talk a certain way. It's that you have collapsed and dropped yourself. Yes. So let's just take a moment to define what in your mind, uh, healthy masculinity looks feels smells like and what healthy femininity looks smells looks like mm. right i know that when we are teaching the gratitude kata yeah in bridge experience we say uh gratitude for the masculine for logic reason structure yeah right? so structure for me is the one that when i think of masculine i think of the container that holds the content and the content is the feminine mm. right like if we're thinking of a water container a vessel the container itself is the masculine. It's the boundaries. It's the rigidness of being able to hold something. You need rules and boundaries in order to hold something, right? And that to me is the masculine, right? It is the container of which life can move through when it is being held. Mm. Now, the content is the feminine that could always be changing and moving and flowing. And to me, content is flow. It's that thing that can always move, can always change. But there's, there's a radiance about it. There's a thing of like creative life force about it, which to me is the feminine. And that's why the feminine doesn't look any particular way because it's creative in and of itself. So it's right. constantly changing. Right. Even the words you're speaking right now, any words are the feminine. That's it. Anything, any movement is our divine feminine, if you may. 
uh, I think where we get caught up is the idea that there's a particular way it's supposed to look right. when we are that. Now, how do you reconcile that with the, let's call it biology and the part of, because, you know, when, when, when men are by themselves or, you know, sometimes they're with their partners and they're speaking to their gripes, one of them is like, ah, oh, I just want, I just want to feel her nurturer. I want mm -hmm. to feel the nurturer in her. Yeah. And there is a lot of pushback in the sort of feminism world about like, why do I, why do I have to be the nurturer? Like, do you think that's true? Do you think that there's a, a biological piece in here that um, some people just go against because they, they want to buck against the machine or like? It's interesting because I can only speak for myself as a biological woman. Um, I do have that natural tendency to care and and put relationship first. Um, but I, I saw something recently and it, it was on somebody's page I follow that's like a, he does like Christian father's work. Um, and I really like a lot of stuff he shared. He shared something about in the Bible, it speaks about how men are actually supposed to be the nurturers in the marriage and how we've got it wrong. And it was like an interesting take that I was mm. like, I've never heard that before. Um, and he quoted some, you know, biblical quote on mm. it and talked about this passage that said, it's the man's duty, how a man shows up is the nurturer of the family. Mm. He nurtures the family. And he said, we've got it wrong as a society because we're putting that job on the woman. And in the family system, the woman's job is to nurture the children and the man's job is to nurture the family. Mm. And it was just an interesting take because I've well, always I, said that. I like, agree with mother's that. the mother, right? Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. But what if there is no children? Yeah, I mean, and, and what, again. What if we're hunting and gathering? Well, what and, is gathering? What is hunting? Right. Well, we don't hunt and we don't gather anymore. So I think that's inherently an issue too. Is Correct. We've got these biological. But it's still there. It is. Exactly. We've got these biological predispositions to want to gather and be around as mm -hmm. women and like, you know, provide for the family in that way and mm -hmm. also be around community. Whereas the men are kind of one track and want to provide in that way and mm -hmm. bring home the bacon. Mm -hmm. Um but it's interesting, you know, I, I I think the older I get, the more I realize that everybody has a, a lean and a proclivity to certain things. Like we look at our kids, we've got four kids. Zai, one of our children, he is super affectionate. Mm -hmm. Like he wants to be attached and stuck on and mm -hmm. close to someone at all times. Mm -hmm. Is that a man that's gonna be very nurturing in his partnership? I think so, mm -hmm. I think so. And then I look at Zizi, you mm -hmm. know, our only girl. She's probably the least mm -hmm. amount of that, mm -hmm. you know. So, is it inherent? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Mm, yeah. Same. All right. So, let's get into rapid fire. What would you say to somebody who wants to cultivate more of their inner masculine and inner feminine? Mm. I would say to whoever that is to get into your body do primal screams, go swimming, go walking, take your shoes and socks off and put them on to the ground and allow your emotions and the part of you that just wants to feel something to feel so that when you start directing your masculine at your business and your relationship and your ex and your why, your cup is already full because you've already said yes to the animalistic part of you that needs to be felt. Mm, okay, so would you say that for the inner feminine as well, cultivating the inner feminine? Like, no. how would you cultivate your inner feminine as a man? Yes, so for me, if I was, as I cultivate my inner feminine, it is about uh, taking time to ask and be with me, me the personality, me the soul, and me the body. What does me need? And how can I nurture that part of me today? That's how I would do it. Okay. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I think uh, my advice for someone who wants to cultivate their inner masculine um, and not the shadow masculine of control, but the, the inner masculine of dignity is really figuring out where your boundaries are and rem reminding yourself that boundaries aren't walls, but they're doors. They are things that can let things in and out but it does cultivate almost like your garden. It's the fence that keeps the, the rodents out and the deer out and it allows your garden to grow. So really getting clear on what your boundaries are um, and what you need and don't need so that you can trust that you have your own back. That gives you that inner sense of worthiness 
and inner dignity. Cultivating the inner feminine, I think, is really about listening to your desires and your truth of how you want to express and be and experience the world. And I think so often as women, we put those ideas aside because it's scary to be in our wild and to have that part of ourselves be seen. But when we say yes to that, our desire is our inner compass. It's not that we have to say yes to all of our desires, but it's pointing us to a direction of our truth. And if we listen to it, even if we just acknowledge it and give it attention, it it feeds us. It takes us into the right direction of more of our true, authentic, raw expression. Boom. Well, uh, that uh, concludes our uh, venture into the world of uh, masculine and feminine and polarity. Uh, again, if you would like to have deeper conversations like this with a community of people who are amazing, uh, we super duper invite you into the sanctuary. Sanctuary is a community where spirituality and life coaching come together and we debate and talk and laugh and hold each other through these processes. So if you are in a space and a place where you want family, you want a place to learn and grow and stretch yourself, but you also want to have friends, come hang out with us in the sanctuary. Yes, Go yes. to www.thebridgemethod.org forward slash sanctuary.